Fuller of Vanderbilt. First woman to play in a Power Five conference football game. Hey everyone, this is Will O'Toole, post Thanksgiving. And believe me, I am, no pun intended, stuffed from all the good food that I was able to eat over these last four days. And I hope that Thanksgiving was as good to you as it was to me, that you got together with family and friends and feasted and had uh, some time to watch plenty of football. For me, I was able to sit on the couch for once yesterday after having so many guests over and finally relaxing. And I got to watch plenty of football, college football, that is. And uh, one of the players who participated was a woman by the name of Sarah Fuller, who is normally a soccer player for Vanderbilt University out there in Tennessee. But yesterday, she was asked and did participate in a Division I Power Five conference football game for Vanderbilt and the Commodores against the University of Missouri Tigers, a game that was out of hand before uh, it was even played. Uh, I believe Missouri won the game 41 nothing, but uh, her participation in the game was really the story. Uh, both teams are basically going nowhere, and uh, it was a good opportunity to give uh, Sarah Fuller a chance to uh, show her uh, abilities on a football field. Uh, normally, she's kicking goals or, or uh, for the Vanderbilt Commodores soccer team. Yesterday, though, I was kind of disappointed. As uh, she does go out there, and uh, if you do see any of the replays, and this is why I'm disappointed, not because of uh, the kick itself, but because of the strategy involved. Uh, I think everyone, when I did hear that she was playing, and of course, I just want to, and we will tackle this in a couple of minutes. She's not the first woman to participate uh, on the college level. There have been about uh, three or four preceding her, but she uh, for the most part, she's on the same level as, or as what is seen as the same level as all the big time schools. And of course, Vanderbilt, if you don't follow college football, they're in the Southeast Conference. They're in the same uh, league as Alabama, Auburn, Florida, Texas A&M, uh, Georgia, Tennessee, the two Mississippi teams, Mississippi State and Ole Miss, Kentucky, and of course, last year's champion, LSU. I don't think I forgot any of the members if I, oh, and South Carolina. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Vanderbilt was going nowhere. They have never really challenged for a conference tile, but nonetheless, uh, they do participate in uh, the Southeast Conference. And over the last few years, they've had uh, or made some inroads into playing or being more competitive. I remember about the, uh, well, uh, they've been getting better. I would actually really say for the, for, the, for the better part of the 21st century, they've gone to a number of ball games. They've had a number of defensive players in the NFL and who have made it. Uh, one guy who I recall is a defensive back, Derek Chivius, but this is way back. This is going back to the days of Peyton Manning when he was in college. But I, I, I think you, you get it. It's an academic school not an athletic school. So the choice for her participating was a perfect scenario. Vanderbilt going nowhere. Uh, the game had no real interest, uh, except maybe the betters with the over-under. <laughs> but anyway, she comes out on the field, and I'm really expecting her in a soccer. I want to watch her just knock uh, the ball all the way out of the end zone. Instead, she was asked to... Uh, give a, a squib kick and she does it. Although the way it, it it looks, it looks like it almost glanced off her toe. And it's a real shame because it was fielded by Missouri. Um, and of course she steps off. Actually, the funny thing is she kicks and it looks like she, she watches the ball and then runs off. She doesn't want to, it doesn't seem she wants to participate in any other part of the, uh, of the action on the field. And of course, um, I'm watching it from a video. I'm not watching the whole field and seeing. It would have been interesting, though, if, if the Missouri uh, player got up and started to run back, what she would have done. 
But you can see she kicks it, kind of freezes for a second, and then runs off the field. What I was really looking for, after you see this, I was hoping that she would uh, onside the kick. That would have been really cool because, like I said, everyone's expecting her to knock it out of the park, and everyone would have been really surprised. Can you imagine if Vanderbilt had recovered a potential onside kick uh, off her off her toe? It would have been even more dramatic. But nevertheless, she does make some inroads for players. Uh, it will be interesting to see this in the future. And, and uh, in a previous podcast, I was saying this. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if a real, well, a real contender. Yes, a real contender. An Ohio State, a Michigan, an Alabama, a Notre Dame, a USC uh, actually had a female kicker. And uh, just watching her in, let's say, a 1917 uh, game that went down to like three seconds left with, let's say, the Rose Bowl or the Cotton Bowl or the Orange Bowl uh, or even a BCS invite on the line and have her kick, have a, have someone kick a 65 yard field goal to win the game. How would Michigan feel if they got beat that way against Ohio state, um, their big 10 bitter rival or Auburn defeating Alabama that way. So uh, that is to be seen down the road. But uh, as I said, it is interesting. It did make um, a splash. It was something to talk about because I, I be honest, yesterday's games. Now this is uh, the Saturday games. For the most part, they were all blowouts, all blowouts, with the exception of the Michigan State Northwestern game. I'm not talking about Rutgers Purdue because there was really nothing at stake there, and of course, uh, but Michigan State Northwestern, the Spartans knock Northwestern basically out of the title. Any, any chance of getting into the BCS. Uh, had Northwestern won that game, they'd be 6-0 and and really moving up uh, the ladder because uh, what's happening right now, and I guess this is a pet peeve of mine, unfortunately, Ohio State's season is basically uh, being cobbled together as we speak, but it's been halved. They're only 4-0, and and yet really the pollsters, it seems, want to keep them in uh, the playoff picture. And what's going to be unfair, I think, is this. It may get to the point if Ohio State, and this may be another uh, argument uh, or of contention, is this. If, let's say, they're 4-0 and and they can't play any more games, and you have, let's say, a BYU 11-0 and on the outside looking in, or let's say a, a Clemson, well, I won't say Clemson, but I'll, I'll say Florida. Let's say they win the rest of their games, and they're eleven and one, and they're not uh, one of the six teams that gets to the ball. You're really going to have a real problem. And uh, or Cincinnati, there's a team within their own state. They had a recent game canceled, postponed because of COVID, but they're eight zero on the year, and they definitely have a a, well, an outside chance of a candidate for the Heisman Trophy in their quarterback. But there's a team that's doubled the number of games Ohio State, and they can't climb over the Buckeyes. And can you imagine, this would be a perfect year, really, when you think about it, to just say, all right, let's take some perennial powers, the Alabamas, the Clemsons, and maybe the Notre Dames, if everything falls in line for them. And if Ohio State is 5-0, and oh, maybe they should be surpassed by these two other teams, uh, one an independent, the other from uh, uh, the American Conference, and just give them a shot in the field of six. Now, I'm not saying they're, they're going to go anywhere and probably talent for talent, you know, uh, player for player, Ohio State has the more talented teams, but they haven't played any games. No fault of the players themselves, but my problem is this. If they only have four or five games, and you have two other teams that have doubled the number, and they're overlooked. It's really unfair. And just like uh, 
Sarah Fuller was given a shot in a losing ser series for a year for Vanderbilt. Hey, give those two teams that would never get a shot in all regular circumstances, let them play for the uh, for the big game. And it would make things more interesting, believe me. Just getting back to Sarah Fuller, um, there is an interesting thing, and I did a little research on the number of women that did play. Uh, there was a, a kicker, all kickers. I'm not saying that they were all uh, field goal kickers, but they all were kickers. April Gross of Kent State played in 2015. Uh, you had Ashley Martin, but she was at the lower uh, divisions. She played back in 2001. And you have Liz Heaston, 1997. She's really the first one that makes an appearance. And I think she was with Willamette College out in Oregon. Uh, she actually played on a pretty good team. And she did participate and she had an important role as the kicker on that team. But the one who I really want to uh, cover is this <laughs> because uh, it may never be done again with the way things are. And that is a girl by the name of Katie Haninda. I think I pronounced it right. H-N-I-D-A. Now, she didn't play for just one Division One team. She played for two. And she first made her appearance in a football uniform for the University of Colorado, the Buffaloes, with Gary Barnett way back when in the uh, in uh, the early 2000s. Now, the interesting thing is this. She does transfer later on and really makes her appearance uh, with University of New Mexico, the Lobos. The interesting thing about her career is that she was in uniform, for not one, not two, not three, but four bowl teams. Now, I know it seems like everyone and his brother, if you finish six and five, you go to a bowl game. But that's still pretty remarkable because way back when, when she does it, uh, her first game was, uh, let me just see here. I'm just going through my thing. Oh, boy, I'm going to have to go to my trusty, my trusty. Back in 2002. She played in the Las Vegas ball game on Christmas Day. And then uh, she played, uh, well, she didn't participate, but she was uh, on the roster for the 2002 Las Vegas Bowl. And that was Colorado, I believe, against Boston College. But then she played in three successive uh, bowl games, all the inside bowls. And she makes her appearance in the. Uh, yeah, she played in the Insight Bowl game, and she actually went out to make an extra point kick. It was blocked, or she would have been the first player, first female player, to actually record a point in a postseason game or in a bowl game. But nevertheless, she does play in four bowl games, three Insight games, free New Mexico, and the Las Vegas Bowl. And the reason why I think that's kind of remarkable is that find me a Division One player who's done four. Usually now, if you're a really good player, uh, you're leaving after your junior year, so you're only playing in three. That may be a record that is uh, will be uh, hard hard to top. Uh, the only way you can really top it is play five bowl games. You can, it could be done, but if you're really that good of a talent in today's uh, college football, you Go to the pros, and the next bowl you're playing in, you're hoping, is the Super Bowl, or at least the Pro Bowl. Ah, but nobody ever plays in the Pro Bowl. That's, oh, man, they've done everything they could in their power to uh, just have any kind of interest in the Pro Bowl. They should just do away with it. Anyway, uh, that's that's uh, an interesting little thing. But uh, Liz, for all you trivia people out there, the first was Liz Heaston. H-E-A-S-T-O-N, I think I pronounced it right, 1997. Then it was Ashley Martin, 2001. And, of course, uh, Sarah Fuller, April Gross, and, of course, uh, Katie Heninda. She's the only one of the five that have gone to bowl games. And, of course, as I said, Liz Easton did it not at the Division I level, but she was at, I think, Division I AA or uh, one 
double, triple A when it was called that. Anyway, uh, just thought it was fun. I know that I always don't pay full tribute to uh, all the females playing sports out there. And uh, uh, so this was a great opportunity to bring in a little bit of sports history and, um, yeah, you know, just current things that go on in the world of sports. And in light of everything that's gone on in college sports, it's a nice story. And um, so congratulations to uh, Sarah on her. Listen, she's been able to do something I never got a chance to do. And that was actually play college sports and make an appearance in a big time college football game. So kudos to her. Uh, the other uh, thing I'd like to talk about before I turn and that is the case of the NFL. I am so rooting <laughs> this year. I, I'm not normally a Giants fan, but I, I love chaos, especially when it comes to the NFL. And the reason why I love chaos in the NFL is because the league prides itself at, at really being um, uh, really neat to the point of obsessiveness that you have to tuck in your jersey, that you have to keep your socks a certain length, that you have to keep them pulled up, that you have to wear a certain type of laces and all the rest of it. Uh, the NFL has gone really bonkers with that. I, I really love the days of when the shirt tails were hanging out. There was just mud <laughs> from the first few seconds in a game. As I always tell you, watch a Cleveland game against Green Bay in the 1960s. It was just mud galore. <laughs> I know that moms around the world don't like those games, but they are fun to look at. And uh, it, it, that's the nature of football. Shirt tails hanging out, mud, socks all the way down. Uh, it was just great stuff. Guys taped up with on their forums and all the rest of it. And I just find it amazing today. Uh, they might as well have uh, the uniforms when they come out at halftime. They should be be pressed by the local cleaners before they go out for the second half kickoff. That's how the NFL has become. That the socks have to be a certain length and have to be pulled all the way up. Shirt tails tucked in, et cetera, et cetera. So anytime that there's a little bit of chaos or where the NFL kind of looks embarrassed by cer certain circumstances, I love it. And it's a blessing in disguise that the NFL, NFC East is just a disaster this year. I mean, the only thing missing from it is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers from 1976 being in their division. And actually, <laughs> if the Buccaneers, who didn't win a game for about 32 straight before when they came into the league. If they were playing in this division right now, they would probably be not only contenders, but in first place. I am talking about every team right now, not only under 500, but at least three games under. And I was just doing a, a quick check. Of course, Washington defeated the Cowboys in one of the most – I will tell you this. For Thanksgiving Day games that I was looking forward to, <laughs> I feel like I was uh, a prescient for the Detroit Lions. I was talking about how they have not been uh, a real player in in the uh, NFC or in the NFL playoff picture, except for a couple of years. And boy, did they look horrible on Thursday. And it actually cost Matt Patricia his job and also the GM, Bob Quinn, uh, really the Lions looked, for lack of a better word, uh, pathetic. And I would only use that with professionals because that's their job. They just looked terrible. And um, I, I don't want to lay the blame on anybody, but this is a team that just looked out of sorts, that didn't even look like they wanted to be there. Now, I know there was no crowd, but... I am sure that maybe you do want to be home on Thanksgiving celebrating with your friends and family. I get all that, but there is that tradition. It's it's not like the Lions are asked at the last minute, would you play? Everybody knows going in that you will be the premier, you will be the kickoff game to Thanksgiving uh, weekend of football. And usually the players do look forward to it. 
Uh, I'm not saying every game has always been dramatic or a classic, uh, but I did look this up. I knew it was bad news when I saw that the Lions were shut out the previous week, and I I didn't relay this to uh, my podcast watchers, and I do appreciate that you do watch this on Park Ridge TV. But the Lions hadn't been shut out prior to a Thanksgiving Day game. Uh, it went all the way back to 1990 when the Giants shut them out by the same score they got shut out the previous Sunday, 20 to nothing. And of course, they lost that day, day too in 1990. So uh, <laughs> things were not looking good. I thought about it. It's funny how I come up with people always say, well, where do you come up with this? It just hits you. Something just hits me and I, I start to look. And when I saw that zero standing up, up there, I was like, how many times have the lines been shut out on Thanksgiving? Well, it happened a number of times. And then I thought, oh, wait, they got shut out the previous week. How many times did the Lions get shut out the day, you know, the game before playing Thanksgiving? You're going to go back 30 years. That's quite a bit. So I knew that the Lions were in bad shape. Anyway, speaking of bad shape, the Lions, here's how bizarre it would be. The Lions would now be in first place in the NFC East. Matt Patricia would probably still have his job. Bob Quinn would probably be seen as some sort of great architect of a dynasty in the making if they were playing in the NFC East. Because as of right now, Washington is four and seven. Going into Sunday morning, the Eagles were three, six, and one. I love that record simply because there are no more ties in the NFL with, uh, you know, with the overtime being played or they are so infrequent that it makes the tie really stand out. And it's a lot of fun with that. And then you have the Cowboys three and seven. And of course, uh, following that up, uh, the Cowboys, excuse me, are three and eight, and the Giants are three and seven. And I was going over their schedule, and real quick, uh, with all the teams, only the Eagles and the Cowboys have two more games in the with Eastern Division teams. So uh, Washington has one against the Eagles. The Giants have one against the Cowboys. The Eagles have the Cowboys in Washington, and obviously, uh, excuse me, the Eagles have the Cowboys in Washington, and the um, the Cowboys had the Eagles and the Giants. So I'm looking. And why I love that tie so much is that, and this is what I'm really rooting for. I did it. I'm pretty sure my math is right. And the, if A beats B and B beats C and C beats D, I have maybe the Eagles could win the division with a 4-11-1 and one record. Now, you know where I'm taking this. I would love, I would be the biggest Eagles fan if they finished 4 11 and 1. All right. They would have the best of the worst records because I think the other three could finish all 4 and 12. But the Eagles, if they finish 4 11 and 1, you know I'm win I am rooting for them to get and win the Super Bowl. They would finish four games under 500. And win the Super Bowl. How I would love that. And of course, uh, if Carson Wentz still can stay healthy and get there, it would be kind of great if he could win that Super Bowl for them. But how horrible. And to think that theoretically, Detroit could finish nine and seven, finish in last place potentially in the NFC Central have their general manager and head coach fired and not even qualify for the playoffs and a team that they have basically double the wins, the Eagles with a 4-11 and one record could make uh, the playoffs and make a real drive in the, uh, in the postseason and in, in the playoffs. That would be remarkable. So then I was doing a little bit more on this and just bear with me as I look for the uh, thing. Oh, here it is. Actually, what I was starting to look at was this. This got me thinking. And I said, how many times have the NFC division winner uh, won fewer than uh, or didn't have double digit wins that they won fewer than 10 games? Now, 
let's just do this. If actually you're a giant fan, you're in pretty good shape, statistically speaking, because the Giants have made the playoffs in uh, since we've gone to six. Oh, well, I shouldn't say since we've gone to 16 games. Since the Giants and the NFL went to 16 games, the Giants actually made the playoffs with uh, four times with nine and seven records. And they made the playoffs with an eight and eight record in 2006. The Eagles have made it four, um, four times since 1978 with fewer than 10 wins. They were nine and seven the last two years, 2019 and 2018. And then in 2008, they were nine, six and one. So I'm rooting again. There they are with the tie. And then in 1978, they finished nine and seven. Uh, that may have been under Dick Vermeil and his uh, really, he helped make the Eagles uh, rebuilt that franchise. They do, though, uh, make uh, the playoffs in 1960, but they were 10 and two. But remember, they were only playing 12 games though, then. So that's a pretty remarkable record by the. Uh, Philadelphia Eagles in 1960. And of course they beat, if, if you remember in one of my uh, previous shows, they beat the Packers 17-13. That was Chuck Bednarik. He's one of the last guys to play both ways in the NFL. I mean, there have been guys since then, but he was really the last of the big time players going both ways. Uh, they won in 49. They were champs going 11-1. and one. And then they won and lost in 48 and 47. Those are the Steve Van Buren years. Uh, they were 8 and 4 and 47. And then they were 9, 2 and 1. <laughs> the, the Eagles love to tie and make the playoffs. So they're in good shape too. I'm just going by statistics here. The Washington Redskins. Oh, can't say that. The Washington football team were... Uh, Remember, they had a long, long standing of just mediocrity and not making it. Actually, it was Vince Lombardi who turned them into a winner. He goes there in 1970, <laughs> and Lombardi maintains his rec his overall, his personal record of never finishing under 500. That 1969 team finished seven five and two, I do believe, or in the 19 yeah, 1969 team sent Finished seven five and two uh, with Sonny Jurgensen at the helm. They were exciting, and uh, I loved it. They used to have the spears for the helmets. Think of uh, Florida State's football helmet, except the Redskins was simpler. It was just it, it, and with the red background, that maroon background, the spear really, really showed. Actually, in the early sixties, they had a feather that went down instead of a stripe. That was pretty unique. Uh, I've never seen another team do that. I like that, um, but I really like the spears on the side. Anyway, the Redskins in 2015 were nine and seven. Oh seven, they were nine and seven. 2007 and 92, they were nine and seven. Now, here's a caveat: in 82, they were eight and one, but that was a strike season, and they do win the Super Bowl. And of course, by 1971. Uh, the architect of this was long gone, Vince Lombardi. Uh, it's come to cancer. I think it was stomach cancer. It's terrible. Uh, that Washington Redskin team led by Larry Brown. And I think I spoke to you. Uh, I had mentioned about Larry Brown and Vince Lombardi discovering that he had no hearing or, or very bad hearing in one side of his, uh, in one of his ears. And he asked the league to put, set him up with a microphone or a headphone so that he could hear the plays. But Larry Brown was one of the uh, key uh, members of that early 70s team and actually makes the uh, Super Bowl in 73. But in 71, they were 9-4-1. and one. I think they tied the uh, Cardinals that year, and they make the playoffs um, in 1971. But again, that was only 14 games. And my whole point is uh, – it's so uh, – it, it's not impossible. Oh, and then I get 
really the team that has uh, really benefited the least from making the playoffs. Like what I mean is they really have to win double digits uh, for them to get into the playoffs is ironically the Cowboys. I was looking that really the first time they make the playoffs with uh, under 10 wins was 1967. But here's the thing. They only played uh, 14 games. They were nine and five. I think they get beat by Cleveland. No, I'm sorry. They get beat in 67 by the Packers. Pardon me. I'm so used to them getting beat by Cleveland when I was a kid, but they were nine and five, but then they were playing uh, in the capital division. Actually, that's a great trivia question for all those. And 1960, I think 60, I'm going to say 68, 69 and 67. There were four divisions in the NFL. All began with the letter C. Only one of them remained today. And that's the central division. And all four of those teams are still in the same division, Detroit, Minnesota, Chicago, and Detroit. But they had the capital, the century, and the coastal. Now, the coastal is easy to remember because you had Baltimore and Atlanta, two Atlantic Coast teams, along with San Francisco and L.A. So you had Baltimore uh, playing twice on the coast with Johnny Unites. If you ever take a look, they had some great, uh, really some great games between Baltimore and L.A. And uh, Baltimore, I think, loses uh, one year to L.A. Um, they probably would have qualified in any other division. Of course, they lost to L.A. But they were in the coastal, kind of crazy. And then you had, and this is why I don't always remember this, because there was a shuffling of teams. But you had the century and the capital. Now, I'm pretty sure the Cowboys stay in the capital. I know that Cleveland stayed in the century because they were. Always, it seemed that they were always playing each other in the playoffs. The Giants, I think, switched back and forth. But it was ready for this. The Century Division had the Giants, I believe New Orleans, the Cowboys, and St. Louis. And then the Century was Cleveland, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, and New Orleans. And then I think they switched. I think they brought New Orleans and St. Louis over to the Century and then put... Uh, uh, the other two teams, not New York and Dallas, so the other two teams I was mentioning as I was going through this litany of teams, they put them in the century. Oh, and Washington had to be in there too. So it went back and forth. But I just remember this. Um, it was the Cowboys, Washington, New York, and sometimes New Orleans. It was strange. Or And, and New York and New Orleans were with uh, in the century division with uh, Cleveland. And I'm just doing this on the top of my head, but I do know that there were four divisions all began with the letter C. And that's always a fun trivia question. It gets you thinking. And remember what I always do on this show, if we're talking sports, it's just like being in a bar at the end of a game. We're talking and things just hit you in the head. Um, in fact, what I'll do is this. If, if I have a shot here, I'll, I'll go on. But the Cowboys in 67 were 9-5. and five. I think they were in the capital division. But the Cowboys were 8-8 eight and eight in 99. They were 6-3 and three in 82, and they get beat by Washington, I believe, in the championship game. And of course, that was a strike short in season two. So really, the Cowboys are the team that's on the outs because only four times in their history have they made the playoffs with fewer than 10 wins. And that should be interesting going forward because really the Giants probably have the most experience at <laughs> getting to a playoff without winning 10 games. And in fact, I'm going to even do this. The Giants in 46 and 44 were 7, 3, and 1. So there you go, Philadelphia. Uh, even the Giants can make <laughs> the playoffs with a tie. And they are 8, 1, and 1 in 44. And uh, eight, three, and one in '56, which they won the championship. And then in 1958, they were nine and three in '56. They win the championship. I think that's the game where uh, wide receiver uh, Frank uh, Gifford 
gets nailed. Uh, and he's really, really goes down with a bad concussion in that game. And 58, they finish 9-3 and three and lose to Johnny Unitas. And probably seen as one of the greatest game, if not the greatest game in NFL history. The reason being is that um, they say that the NFL, they made it right then and there. I apologize. I'm moving away from here. I'm just trying to find this. Anyway, maybe I'll do it another day. But those were the teams. I, I'm, I'm just looking at it. And then, uh, like I said, Washington. Here's an interesting thing with Washington. They actually made the playoffs with a 7-5 and five record. But that you have to go back to 1936, and they lose the championship. But they were not in Washington at the time. They were in Boston. And then they go 8-3 and three, uh, and, uh, in 1937. And they're ten and one, and win the championship in 1942. So um, again, you got to rem- actually ten and one, playing twelve games, 1942. This is the war years, so they either had a cancellation or they only played eleven. I didn't really uh, have time to look that up. That that would be interesting. But basically, Washington, 92, they finished nine and seven. 2007, they finished nine and seven. 2015. Nine and seven. Uh, all these teams, you can say this about the NFC East, is that uh, this is definitely, well, maybe this was something long in coming for the division because some of the teams were coming down. Some of the teams have not risen. But uh, I, I would expect that next year, these teams obviously improve because basically that's what happens in the NFL. Uh, when you have a, (laughs) here's what's going to happen even, even more so is this, is that generally when you have a losing record, uh, they match you the following year with teams that have bad records. Um, and you know, conversely, if you're really, if you had a good record, they match you with other teams that have good records. And I know that every year they, um, rotate, what ASC teams you're playing and all the rest of it. I get all that. But they did for a while there, and I'm still thinking it's true, that they also try to help the teams that are crummy uh, forge a better record the following season. And really, when you think about it, uh, if most games are decided by seven or fewer, uh, it really comes down to one possession. So maybe those games that you lost, maybe you lost a handful of games, three or four games by fewer than seven points, uh, the odds are you win those games next year and you go from, let's say, uh, an eight and eight team to a 12 and four or a four and 12 team, maybe up to eight and eight or even seven and nine. So you do improve. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast because the talent level at that at that stage is just so close. It really does come down to one play, uh, one missed field goal. One extra time, you know, one timeout that wins or loses a game. That's the nature of football. It's what makes it so exciting. But really, looking at this, it is amazing. Uh, just in the last few minutes here, I- I'm looking at this and I can tell you this Philadelphia, a dominant team in the late 40s. Then they're not heard from in the 50s. And remember, at one point during the 40s, during those war years, Pittsburgh and Philly actually uh, cobbled together a team to become the Steagles. It still doesn't help either team. Uh, And Philadelphia then goes 18 years or 19 seasons without a win, uh, without making the playoffs in 78. Uh, So they they go a while there. And then really – 81, of course, they get to the uh, Super Bowl. But I'm just looking at nine win seasons, and it's just a handful of times uh, for Philadelphia and for the Cowboys. So going in here, you'd have to really give the Giants the edge. And I'd, I'd give the Giants and the Eagles an edge, and maybe the Cowboys do finish in last place, uh, just judging on the playoff system as we're going. I had one other thing I want to uh, talk to you about as I leave, and that is just a final tribute to one of soccer's great players, Ola Diego. Diego Maradona, 1960 to 2020. 
Real quick about Diego, great soccer player. I don't know too much about soccer other than I've become more and more interested in the last few years. And uh, what I really noticed about when I was doing some investigating about the hand of God, and I know that he's been crushed about that and excoriated. Some people just uh, attribute that's just part of his personality. But you got to remember this. I always thought, and of course, again, I'm not really following the sport 30 years ago, but the way the impression that you get with that hand of God is that it wins the championship game and uh, against England and that basically England got uh, the game stolen from them. Well, I was always taught, look, never let a referee or a bad call uh, decide the game. You got to be better than that. That's number one. But on a factual level, Argentina wasn't even expected to really be there because when I was looking at the uh, the seedings and all the rest of it, Argentina isn't like given a high seed. They're just thrown in with the rest of the bunch. But they make it out, get to the uh, round of 16, defeat Uruguay, another South American team. And then in successive games, they defeat European teams. But England who they defeat with the hand of God occurs in what I consider this, uh, the quarterfinals. Then they go on and beat Belgium and then they defeat West Germany. So uh, Diego's goal, which was the first one of that game, it should have been an impetus for England to just overcome that. They fall two nothing and then score late in the second half to kind of get back in the game. But for all those people who thought, ah, that game, no, Maybe it does, but you got to be better than that if you're England. Number two is you could actually say that that hand of God goal does spur, is the catalyst for Argentina to win the World Cup. Hey, this is Willow Tool for Park Ridge Sports History. I'd like to thank you again for welcoming me into your home. And uh, I'll see you next week with another couple of cartoons and some other his history stories. Thanks. Thanks.